Good morning from a uh, pretty chilly new forest, to be quite honest with you. Look behind me, look how it's changed. Look at all that dock, withered and brown. It's a sharp autumnal morning. The warmth has gone from the woodland here, and I'm sat here in a t-shirt, a fleece. I'm just talking about my layering, because people always get obsessed about my multi-layering. Anyway, I've got a t-shirt, a fleece, and uh, this old raincoat that I found hanging in the back of the cupboard there. And it is a nevertheless lovely morning at the moment. I know some parts of the country are extreme, uh, uh, experiencing quite extreme weather at the moment, extreme rain, particularly in the east of England. Our producer Fabian Housen says it's hammering down outside there, but at least we've got a little bit of blue sky and uh, formerly some sunshine here. Now you'll notice of course immediately, unfortunately for you, that I'm on my own. Megan is absent. Yes, but we'll be explaining exactly where Megan is a, a, a little later on. We've got quite a few things to rattle through this morning. I'll do my best to be competent Obviously, in Megan's absence, there'll be a, an absence of discipline. There'll be no doubt about that whatsoever. What have we got coming up? Well, Megs is not here. We have Lindsay Chapman joining us with all of your things. We've got some great things, extraordinary footage of a mink attacking a swan. You're going to be want to be uh, taking a look at that. So it's a, an amazing little clip of a ferocious predator and a bird that fights back. Yeah going to be loving that. Uh, we've also got, of course, Maya Bambrick has been uh, celebrating her 18th birthday. And to do that, uh, she went on a walk around Paul Brooks RSPB Reserve. It's a fantastic reserve in Sussex. If you haven't had the chance to visit, if you're from that part of the world, you really should. She's giving us a brief update about what she found on her walk. You can still give to that walk and we'll be giving you uh, a give to that walk. You can give to that walk. You can give um, to the uh, Cameron Bespolka Trust that she was raising funds for. We'll give you the details a bit later on. Um, Matt Moran, if you cast your mind back throughout the course of our broadcast and indeed uh, Spring Watch, you'll know that Matt Moran is in love with foxes. He lives in urban London and he's been following the fortunes of a family of foxes there for quite some time. He's made us another, another exceptionally beautiful film about the foxes. Matt is a brilliant and accomplished photographer um, and a great filmmaker. Um, but as I say, his passion for these foxes knows no bounds. And so this morning he's going to be giving us an update on what's been going on with his vixen and her cubs and also speaking more broadly about how we should be living alongside foxes as well. Uh, what else? Oh, yes, Soapbox this morning. Because remember, it's campaigning Friday. So if you're on the SIBC uh, Facebook or Twitter or whatever platform you're using, then remember today is campaigning day. And our Soapbox today is about wildlife entanglement, particularly birds. So entanglement, I'm talking about um, anthropogenic waste. I'm I'm principally talking about, of course, plastic waste. And there's a project at the moment running birds and debris, which is asking people to report any animals, particularly birds, that they find entangled in plastic. And you can do so online. So we'll be telling you a bit about that. And then we've got Young Jack. We always like to give our younger viewers and participants as much profile as possible. Um, and Jack is with us this morning. And Jack, like myself, is an aficionado of Ankylosaurus. Yep, he's a dino nut. Um, he's completely nuts about dinos, the pair of us are. So we couldn't resist showing you Jack's uh, uh, views on Ankylosaurus. In fact, Jack has made us three little films about his top three favorite dinosaurs. And we're starting with number three, Ankylosaurus. And we'll be showing you that clip as well. So there we are. That's what we've got coming up this morning. Um, before we do, I've forgotten, of course, due to sort of professional incompetence and the fact that it's all, <laughs> all a bit of a rush this morning, to uh, uh, mention the uh, peregrines which we were watching there. Remember, it's obviously moving into our autumn down in Australia. These birds are in Melbourne in Australia. Beautiful views of them there. They're moving into their breeding season at the other end of the planet. And we're shifting our wildlife webcams down south, as it were, so that we can enjoy those breeding birds throughout the course of the winter. That camera is run by BirdLife. Now, BirdLife are a remarkable organisation that do brilliant work all over the planet for birds. They very often partner with other NGOs, wherever that happens to be in the world. So in this country, of course, one of the principal BirdLife partners is the RSPB. Uh, but do visit the BirdLife uh, website. Um, this one is coming from BirdLife Australia. Um, they are... I think they're a charity. Hmm. Well, they might be a not-for-profit organisation. Doesn't really matter. They deserve our support. And you can donate to BirdLife. And it helps cover some of the cost. And they also have a whole range of webcams all over the world which are worth looking at as well. So the details for that are, where can you go? Support.birdlife.org.au 
AU, this is the Australian one for these peregrines, slash donate. So that's support.birdlife.org.au slash donate. I'm sure the link is available to you because that's a bit of a mouthful, that link, isn't it, really? Not the sort of thing that I'm going to, you know, instant. I know I probably would instantaneously remember it, but it doesn't really matter. Um, Shall we move on to the quiz? We've been doing sound quiz for some time, actually. I think maybe it's time for us to move away from sound quiz and come up with another idea. We had skull of the day, and then I think we had odd artefacts. Um, and now we've been doing sound. And there were, of course, we had those brilliant uh, pixelated pictures and all sorts of things. But we'll rub our heads together and come up with a different sort of quiz. But we're still on sound today. And if this is our final sound quiz, we're going out with a bang. Have a listen to this and think, see if you know what this is. This is exquisite. Yeah. Now, I haven't heard that this year, very sadly, due to lockdown, um, because these birds will sing from very early in the year. Um, they've stopped singing now, but they do produce one of the most exquisite songs. You may remember Gary Moore, our sound recordist, who's done a lot of work for Springwatch, particularly with Nightingales, and uh, he was out in that punt. Uh, uh, I think that was when did he go out in the punt? It must have been last winter watch, actually. Fantastic. So he's a brilliant sound recordist. This is his favourite bird song. Gary gets very excited when he hears these, as we all do when we're lucky enough to hear it. So see if you know what that is and let us know. Before we move on, I'm just going to say there are a few people watching. Uh, let's see who's watching us at the moment. Well, I'm sure there's more than these people. I hope so anyway. Otherwise, it's me having a conversation with six people. I don't mind, of course. I frequently have a conversation with just two poodles. So six people would be a bonus. So on YouTube, Alicia in Somerset, uh, Sharma in Essex, Maria in East London, or on Facebook, Sandra in Lincolnshire, Eddie in Basingstoke, and Winnie in Dunbar. Dunbar. I love Dunbar, Dunbar Castle with the peregrine, uh, peregrine, sorry, with the kitty wakes nesting on it. I remember being taken there as a small boy by my father, must have been all of 12 years old. That beautiful red stone wall of Dunbar Castle with kitty wakes nesting just there. And I stood just looking up at them and they were almost within my reach, looking at their beautiful red gape, inspiring place. Absolutely love Dunbar. Hope you're having a good morning up there, Winnie. Could be a bit rainy, I suppose. Okay, where is Megan? That's the question. Megan is having a good time. Here she is. Have a look at this and have a listen to this. She goes off on one about Second World War aircraft. Victory! Good morning, everyone. Happy Friday. I hope you're having a fantastic day, a fantastic morning, sat there eating your breakfast. It feels really weird, actually, that I'm not there today. I'm really sorry that I'm missing it. I'm kind of a bit gutted. I really, really do enjoy our Friday mornings and our SIBC ramblings that Chris and I inevitably go off on many, many different tangents. But um, I'm currently up in Scotland. I've just uh, had a, a day yesterday on Sky. Um, and so today I've just hiked up this mountain, which is relatively close to where the Sky Bridge is. Uh, but it's absolutely beautiful. I mean, have a look at the scenery around here. Absolutely stunning. I'm a bit out of breath. I'm a little bit sweaty, so I do apologise for that. Um, just a few minutes ago as well, we had this military plane that came over the top and it was kind of meandering around that road that you can see just there. <laughs> um, it was really, really cool. I've got no idea what type of military plane it was. That's why you need a Chris with you, because Chris would have been able to tell me immediately what type of plane it was um, and all, all the history about what it was used for and its engine and um, what, what, you know, the diameter of the plane wing length and the turbo, and do they have turbos in, you know, these old military, pla I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> I've gone off on one by myself. I never normally do, well, I do do that. Um, but anyway, I've had a fantastic few days going a little bit off grid, of course, being incredibly COVID, uh, careful with the new restrictions and, you know, abiding by those. Um, and trying to see as much wildlife as possible. So I had some great sights of some eagles. They were a little bit far away. It was a bit of a rainy day that day. So they were off in the distance, hugging the top of a peak. Um, some red squirrels too. Uh, coal tits, crested tits. I love crested tits. They're just one of the most funkiest little birds, aren't they? They're really, really cool. Um, but yeah, the, the highlight though, the highlight is something I'm going to have to share with you a little bit later. I've got some amazing footage of a species which has unexpectedly turned up in Scotland over the last couple of weeks. Uh, it's a little bit of a conservation concern because they're not 
always here they shouldn't be in the area that they have shown up in um so we uh, yeah i've been doing a bit of filming on that story and that will be coming to you very very shortly in the next couple weeks or so so make sure you keep a lookout for that um but yeah i hope you're having a fantastic week and chris is uh behaving himself keeping on track uh, i've set him up now he's gonna go off on a tangent about military airplanes so <laughs> i'm sure i have no doubt i have faith that he will do that um but anyway yeah i will see you next friday live at 9 a.m but for me that's it and uh yeah i hope you have a great show and i will see you soon It's, it's, it's going to be a mystery now, isn't it, as to what which aircraft that was. In fact, it's tantalising me. I mean, Megan is implying, of course, that it was a vintage aircraft and not a modern contemporary jet aircraft. And it was a very picturesque location. So imagine seeing a vintage, you know, Second World War fighter flying through there. That would have been quite something. I would have been quite excited about that. I wonder what it was. I wonder what it was. No adequate description required. Points lost by Megan. But at least she was interested in a second world, well, a, a modicum of interest, you know, in a second world war fighter aircraft. And of course, we have to remember that only recently we've been celebrating a Battle of Britain day. Um, and one aircraft that people forget about, I think, which is rather unfortunate, because when it comes to the Battle of Britain, everyone thinks about Spitfires, of course. And then if they think, actually, they should, you know, if you think about hurricanes, Hawker Sidley hurricanes as well, because there were more hurricanes fighting, certainly during the Battle of Britain um, at that time. Um, but there's another aircraft called the Bolton Paul Defiant. Now, the Bolton Paul Defiant was an aircraft that was um, built, invented and built long before the, the Second World War. Um, it was a two man aircraft, had a little bubble behind with a, 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 gu a gunner in it. So I had a pilot and then a bubble with a, a gunner in it. Um, and it fought at the beginning of the Battle of Britain. And I have to tell you very sadly um, that it wasn't up to it. When it came up against the Messerschmitt BF 109Es, um, it just wasn't up to it. And the pilots of the Bolton Paul Defiant gave enormous um, bravery in, in that struggle. And very often they're forgotten, which I've always thought was a real shame. Everyone thinks about the Spitfire pilots and all that sort of stuff. But you think about those poor young men who went up in the Bolton Paul Defiance, which was an aircraft which just wasn't up to the job, I'm afraid. Um, it was out of, out of date and out of time. And there are websites where you can look at them. But um, next year I might do what I can to help raise the profile for, for those pilots of the Bolton Paul Defiant. Anyway, it's worth thinking about. And I've, just as Megan said, yeah, I've gone off on one on about, I mean, it was highly unlikely that she saw a Bolton Paul Defiant. Had she seen one, I'd have been really, really excited because I've never seen one, actually. I'm not sure there were actually any of those Bolton Paul Defiants actually in the air at the moment. But uh, anyway, there we are. There we are. OK, we better move on. Uh, Lindsay Chapman is joining us this morning. She's been trawling through uh, all of the enormous amount of good stuff that you send us, trying to pick out a few highlights. Lindsay, good morning. How are you? Good morning to you, Chris, and everybody at home. I'm very well, thank you. I have to say that my granddad was in the air sea rescue during World War II. So uh, your little spiel that you went on there, very interesting to me, actually. But I have to give a shout out to Michelle Davy, who needs to be finished by 10 o'clock this morning because someone has cheekily put a meeting in her diary with that little spiel, not sure we're going to make the 10 o'clock, but it was very interesting. So yeah, thank hold you. On. Linz, the, the Bolton Paul Defiant um, needs a little bit of, it's, it's like, um, what, how would you describe it in sort of avian terms? It's, it's one of the unsung heroes. I mean, frankly, it's a, it is a bit of a meadow pipit, you know, as opposed to the Spitfire perhaps being a hobby or a peregrine falcon. The Bolton Paul Defiant was a bit of a meadow pipit. But nevertheless, you know, they took to the skies and, and the men that flew them did their duty in, a, in an extraordinary time. And we owe them a great debt. So I just felt it was worth saying that they're, they're not forgotten by people like myself, I can tell you. That's brilliant. And we learn something different every single time we do one of these broadcasts. So very Maybe not something you're expecting or wanting to learn, but nevertheless. <laughs> so, anyway, wait, let's move on to the wild world and get away from Second World War fighter aircraft. Absolutely. On to the wildlife. A couple of other shout outs. We've got Joe and Filey who says it's wet and windy. That weather front is coming down the east coast. Manchester, though, is a little bit brighter. To people in Edinburgh and Cambridge as well, everybody saying hello this morning as I am watching the feed live. Um, Joe West. Joe West has binge watched 46 of these episodes, Chris, to catch up. Come on. Now, come on. Honestly, 
putting up with all that rambling about tanks, landing craft. I think we did, did we do the Dieppe raid or was that on something else? The Dieppe raid had, I gave that a good five minutes of nonsensical sort of addition to a sun broadcast recently. That, that's an impressive watch. I hope I hope he he did manage to sort of sieve some sense out of the ramblings that we that we did, that we all do yourself and our guest and and Megs and I. Forget forget Netflix. This is where it's at. And I can tell you this morning, everybody at home, it is wonderful to be back and to be chatting away with you. Exclusive news: Chris Packham has a hole in his trousers. I've learned oh. this. Yeah, here it is. Right. Look, you see, the thing is that. Uh, I've got, a, I've got a draft going down my shin, a chilly draft going down my shin. Nancy got off the lead in a public place and I had to lunge to grab her before she came to any harm. And these trousers were brand new. First day out, ripped them on the car park. Poodles. <laughs> this is top quality content and I can just feel Fabian in the background screaming at me, get on with it. So let me talk to you about autumn this morning because I've been watching the Facebook page again, of course, uh, chatting on Twitter as well. And many pictures that we're getting in now are moving to autumn, the changes of the season. And um, I just wanted to reflect some of that this morning and have a chat with you about it, Chris. So let's just have a look at some of the photographs that have been coming in. Obviously, there are absolutely loads and we do love having a little look. I know you all talk amongst each other as well. But the Flyer Garrick, look at this. This is from Sophie Cooper on Facebook. Wonderful picture there. Those white gills, obviously very strong red colour, the white spots as well. I would say don't eat this one, Chris. Yes, it's very powerfully but unpleasantly hallucinogenic. Um, so it's not one that you would eat to, to stimulate yourself in any anything other than a very bad way. So please don't eat fly agaric mushrooms. They are the archetypal fairy tale mushrooms, the ones that you see with those white spots. They're not spots of pigment. Um, they actually, uh, the, the cap of the mushroom bursts through a membrane uh, when it expands, filling with water um, to take its form. And as the membrane fragments, those little white spots stick to the surface of the cap. And it's that that, that, that appears to make it spotted. Um, a couple of things about fly agaric, which are interesting. Firstly, how did it get its name, fly agaric? Well, it was formerly minced up and mixed with milk and put in saucers on people's windowsills where it would stupefy flies that came into their house and they would fall into the milk and drown. So it was an early fly, fly killer, if you like. And the other thing is it said that uh, it was added to a concoction that was given to Viking berserkers before they went into battle. And berserkers, the term berserk, comes from a particular form of warrior, suicidal warrior, who would you know, drink a, a, a huge amount, take these stimulants. And then when they went into battle, they, would, you know, they were tall, robust men, and they would be at the vanguard of the fight. And they would go in with their, you know, their axes and other ghastly weapons. And, um, and their mission was to just go berserk and, and terrify the enemy. And very often, of course, they lost their lives, but, they, uh, but they, 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 they were stimulated to sort of be fearless by taking a concoction which had flyer garrick in it. Wow, I, I did not know that. I knew about the flies, but I didn't know about the berserkers. So it's absolutely fascinating. As we say, though, don't try that yourself. You know, it's not something, it's very I clearly, it, it's telling you as well, isn't it? It's telling you, don't eat me because I'm bright red and white. So uh, do stick away from that. But a lovely sign of autumn. And Sophie has loads of great pictures on the Facebook page. So do have a look. Then we've got this one. I like this because this is into autumn and into winter as well. A blackbird amongst the berries there from Julie and Dwyer on Facebook. And of course, one of my favourites for the autumn, Chris, and I know you're going to love this, a bearded tit from Alan Benson. That's I something know. That, yeah, that we can really look forward to seeing, isn't it? It certainly is, yes. Um, they become more apparent at this time of year. If you go to Phragmites reed beds where they're known to be, I mean, I would check online that they're there if you're going specifically to look for them. Uh, they're not all over the country, unfortunately. Um, they're pretty much on the sort of northern western edge of their range, if you like, bearded tits, bearded reedlings, if, if you like, in this country. And, um, but they make a distinctive pinging call. So you very often hear them before you see them um, in the reeds. But they do come down to paths to take grit. They're a granivorous bird, so they're eating seeds. And as a consequence of that, they require grit in their gizzard to grind them up. 
So if you're patient sometimes, you can um, you can see them coming down to the paths amongst that run through any reed beds, eating eating the grit. And in some places, uh, Lake Moss, for instance, RSPB Reserve, they have grit trays for them. So they put out trays with, uh, with ch especially chosen grit, beautiful grit. And... Um, and the uh, the bearded tits come down and take them. You get super close views. I had brilliant views at Lothan Moss uh, uh, of these birds, but they are exceptionally, uh, you know, uh, beautiful. In fact, I've already got a hole in my trouser, so I, it won't. You know, I just oh hello, so I just knock everything over. A little bit of that, a little bit of that doesn't go amiss when you see a bearded reedling. To be quite honest with you. Absolutely. I better try and take control once again, though. So the picture should have jumped back to me round about now. They are wonderful. Leighton Moss is a great place to see them. Geese as well. Just have a look at the footage that's come in from Stuart Pike. And I always love to mention geese in the autumn because we think about the summer birds leaving and flying south. But you've got to think about what we're gaining as well in the autumn and winter months. Those geese coming down from Svalbard. I mean, what a sound, Chris. It's stunning, isn't it? I mean, look at this absolutely beautiful i'm going to just stop talking for a moment so that we can actually listen to it yeah um, yeah the, the sound is as much a part of the experience as watching those skeins coming over um, and at this time of year when all of these pink foot and, and barnacles, depending on where you are in the country, of course, white-fronted geese um, come from various parts of Iceland, Greenland, and, uh, and Northern Europe to the UK. They can arrive in enormous ab in, uh, abundance. And, it, and it's always heartening to see large numbers of birds or any animal like that. It sort of harks back to a time when nature was so much more plentiful. And recent reports have told us, of course, that we've lost so much of our nature um, in, in recent times due to our activities. So I, I don't know. It's, it's just I always get sort of a, an up, uplift. I feel so good after I've seen you know, numbers of birds in abundance like that. And in a sky like that, when they're all coming in, a real sign, like you say, uh, Lindsay, of, of autumn and winter coming as they leave the colder parts of their breeding grounds and come down. To, and we're very fortunate to have large numbers of these wintering geese in the UK. And if you have an opportunity on a nice, clear morning to go out to somewhere where they're moving from their roosting to their feeding sites, you get these sorts of views and you're never going to forget it. I remember one day I was up on the North Norfolk coast and the pink footed geese all came over at sunset. and. Uh, you know, it was years ago and I was in a sort of battered car sleeping in, in, in my car, just pulling into sort of farm fields and kipping for the night. And I pulled this car into this farm field and was preparing to get into my sleeping bag. And all of these pink foot came over and I've never forgotten it. I was eat, uh, eating cold baked beans out of a tin. It's all I had to eat. And another tin. I had to choose between cold baked beans and ambrosia creamed rice. I went for the beans. <laughs> <laughs> I love how accurate your memory is on all these things. It's incredible. I've you seen don't get those sort of things, Linz, to you be don't, quite honest. You don't, when the you don't. is baked beans or ambrosia creamed rice, and all you've got is a spoon and a sleeping bag in a battered old Renault 16 TL, then basically. <laughs> you don't forget it we're going off again we're going off again i remember once being underneath a starling murmuration and thinking oh wow the starlings oh and it's raining on me as well and then i realized it definitely wasn't rain anyway no. uh, we should move on we should move on to another sign of autumn this is one of my absolute favorites this is from kaylee wright and it's a hedgehog and i wanted to show you this because the hedgehog is demonstrating beautifully, as Kaylee said to me, the use of a hedgehog hole. Now, I'm quite interested in this because I have seen more hedgehogs um, over the last sort of three weeks where I live than I have seen for a very long time. And I wondered if they might have actually benefited slightly in lockdown because of people not moving around so much. Those holes in the fences are really important. We need to link up those habitats, allow them to feed in different places. But do you think they might have benefited from lockdown, Chris? I think they could have done. I think a lot more people have been out in their gardens. Uh, the, you know, Hedgehog Hugh Warwick and many other people, the Hedgehog uh, Street people, um, you know, who are, are doing all of their uh, good communication work, um, are, are spreading the word you know, of the need to create hedgehog highways through urban and suburban areas. I think probably more people have been out cutting holes in their fences and that connectivity would have been in, in, improved. More people at home, again, feeding the birds. We know that they've been feeding the birds because bird food manufacturers were telling us they were running out of food. 
Um, so if they have, people are feeding birds, I've no doubt they're feeding their hedgehogs too. So I think that they, they might have benefited from a bit of extra awareness and a bit of extra care. But it's really good to see a hedgehog using the highway. It, and it proves what Hugh and everyone else is saying works, you know, very definitely works. And that's a happy hedgehog squeezing through the fence, no doubt about that. It really is. Brilliant piece of footage. Thank you very much. Now, Chris, you trailed ahead to this rather wonderful clip that was sent in to me from Norfolk Wildlife Rescue and the Norwich Otter Sightings uh, group. And this is a swan and a mink. Now, I think this is quite unusual. So if you watch carefully, you'll see that mink come in. Then the swan sort of hits it with its wing, but then the mink grabs onto the swan's neck and there's a real tussle there. It's amazing. It's an amazing, you know, piece of behavior and when you think back years you know just a few years ago this sort of behavior could have been witnessed by a naturalist a lucky naturalist but it would never have been able to be shared with the rest of us because it's, it looks like it's captured on a on a you know mobile phone a device of some kind and that's another asset everyone bemoans you know the, the, the mobile phone for distracting young people's attention and the fact that we're addicted to them but they do have their uses as well um, and, and capturing things like this is, is one of them. But the mink is a tenacious predator. Unfortunately, it's decimated our water vole population and, and many water birds suffer from American mink predation. It's a non-native invasive species that escaped when people released them from fur farms or they, they, they escaped. Um, they were brought to the UK, as I recall, in sometime in the 1930s. And obviously fur farming is illegal in the UK now, so there's no more kept in captivity, but the mink have naturalized and they, you know, make a nuisance of themselves, to say the least. But taking on a swan, I mean, we think of them, if they're killing water birds, as taking, you know, young birds and also things like moorhen, maybe. But a swan, I mean, this just shows you what we're up against, what water voles are up against. I mean, you know, blimey, you haven't got a chance against a mink if it's going to take on a swan. And the swan, of course, puts up a robust defence. But then the mink even knows to get hold of the head and neck. And somehow or other, even though it's in the water and the swan is much more, you know, probably capable in the water, certainly speedier, um, it gets hold of it. But as we saw at the end, um, the swan does manage to shake the mink loose and, and get away, thankfully. And in many parts of the country, of course, people are trying to control, um, you know, trap out American mink to try and preserve our water bowl population. I noticed Derek Gow had posted a picture in the last couple of days of uh, a water vole that had been destroyed. He didn't say how, but maybe American mink was responsible for that. But yes, yeah, an amazing clip. And again, a real joy um, for us to be able to sh see and share that. And that's just the sort of thing that, you know, you go a lifetime without witnessing these sorts of things, but someone somewhere sees it and now we can all get to see it, which is, which is brilliant. That's absolutely right. And that is why I love doing my job because we can't be everywhere at once. And the footage that we get from across the country is wicked. Kevin Murphy sent that in, big shout out. Uh, just a couple of other interesting bits of behavior that I thought you might like to see. Quickly have a look at this hobby mid-flight. Uh, doing a bit of hunting there, wonderful picture. That one sent in by Richard Brabs. And a cheeky one, a little cheeky grey squirrel to finish with. This is from Tony Watts and that squirrel, I just love the look in its eye. It has spotted some food and you know what's gonna happen next. So wonderful pictures coming in. So kind of you to send them all uh, to me and across the Facebook page. Just one question though, an autumnal question. And this one comes from Claire Aldridge, who's seen loads of crane flies, as I'm sure you have as well. Um, I call them Daddy Longlegs. She calls them Daddy Longlegs as well. Do you know why that name is is as it is? Well, maybe the person who um, invented the name had a father who was particularly tall, and um, and his name was Mr. Crane, and he frequently was travelling overseas. So he was crane flying about, crane, Mr. Crane was flying about, and he had very long legs. I, you know, that would be my best supposition. I don't know. Let's definitely go with that. Let's say that's what it is. Oh, and finally, actually, from Rachel, this is a great one, um, and I'm interested in this as well. She has heard loads of tawnies, but you're, <laughs> you've gone somewhere else, Chris. She's heard loads of tawny owls, but she wants advice on how to see one. Yeah, this is the time of year where tawnies become more vocal. Um, then it's not about territorial disputes at this point. It's more about driving the young out of their territories so that they, well, I suppose that is a territorial dispute, but I don't mean between adjacent adult birds. So having raised their young, moving through autumn into winter, the adults are not conscious of, 
but in need of, of being able to exploit all of the resources in their territory themselves. So that the Tawny Owl territory is going to be based the size of it on the resources available, i.e. the food that, that's in there. And food is, is hardest to come by in winter. So at that point, the adult birds want all of the food in that territory to themselves. They don't want any, any longer to share it with their young. So during September, October, they start to chase the young out of their territories. And there's a lot more vocal, vocalization going on. The young start moving around. Very sadly, we see a lot more of them on the roadsides where they're hit by uh, cars. Um, and they're struggling, of course, to, then to find their own territories as we move into winter, which is really tough. It's the worst time of year to have to go and find your own territory. But that's what... Uh, the, these young tawny owls have to do. So that's why they're more vocal at this time of year. And they're easier probably to see when it, we get to the proper full on winter around December, January, when it's territorial disputes between adults. And then they are, are, are you know, a lot more bold and they're sitting on, you know, bus shelters in urban areas and, and, and more prominent perches, you know, in, 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 in rural areas as, as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Some excellent advice there. Many people saying that they call them daddy longs as long legs as well, but they're not sure about your explanation. They're tipulid, okay. members of the tipulid family. And um, the thing is, I don't know what it's like. I mean, I'm glad this has been brought up because this year is a bumper year for tipulids. The house is full of them. If you leave the window open with the light on down here at the moment, you, you know, you're getting several of them. We're constantly putting them outside. I rather like crane flies, to be quite honest with you. And I, you know, gently take them and, and put them outside last night I put three or four out and um and they're always coming in there's one in the kitchen at the moment actually i saw it earlier flying around to try and rescue it in a bit uh, the larvae are incredibly important lots of birds eat them and particularly on sort of upland moorland areas all of those wading birds that go out there dunlin golden plover uh snipe um lapwing occasionally curlew all of those things are feeding on tipulid larvae in the in the moss up there so as much as they some people might find them a bit irritating when they come in um, they're very much part and parcel of an essential food chain so there we are there you go thank you very much going to finish with a number of your comments thank you for sending them in uh, christine ann Rowland says she's watching us in the bath this morning so hey you can take us anywhere that you want to what by naked people we, we, yeah, we. no, it's true. It's true. She actually said to her sister, um, I'm watching Chris Packham in the bath, meaning that she was in the bath watching you. And um, her sister said, I don't uh, quick. In the bath. She I don't, said, I'm, quick, I'm, tell I'm, me where. I'll put it on now. Tell me where. We like to watch <laughs> naked people. We don't want people watching us naked. No, no, no. That's, that's a it's different totally. programme. Uh, and Tracy Dalton, I think it's Tracy, who says, uh, once in Tanzania was eating a tin of cold beans and missed the only leopard that we saw on the trip. So, you know, you've got to be careful with your cold tinned food. Oh, finally, Lynn says that she really likes my picture. It's a Gideon Con, it's beautiful, and it captures all the seasons, I think. So thank you for that comment. It's wonderful to chat with you all this morning. Thank you for your answers, Chris. Uh, good luck finishing by 10. Ah, oh, okay. <laughs> thanks, Lynn. Thank you very much. Lindsay Chapman, as ever, witty. Not, um, not afraid to um, extract the Mickey. Uh, anyway, as, as, as much as ever, we better move on. Actually, we better crack on uh, because it have been, we have been wittering. We have. I say we. <laughs> it's only me. So I've been wittering. I can't blame anyone else. Uh, Maya Bambrick has celebrated her 18th birthday uh, by doing a great deed. Um, she has been on a walk, a sponsored walk around Paul Brooks Nature Reserve (RSPB) in Sussex, top spot. I've got to say, good for nightingales. Might still be there. I think they are. Yeah, I'm sure. It's pretty certain they are. Um, it's. Uh, a varied uh, collection of habitats and she was doing this on on behalf of the Cameron Bespolka Trust. So here's Maya with an update on how the walk went. Hi everyone, today I'm at RSBB Paulborough Brooks for my wildlife walk raising money for the Cameron Bespolka Trust. We've been really lucky so far. We've seen spotted fly catcher, a clouded yellow butterfly. What else have we seen? Woodlarks. Yeah, woodlarks, spotted fly catcher, siskins, um, less red poles. Loads of stuff, really. Loads of good stuff. So we've only just started, so we're going to go and walk along the wetlands and have a look and see what we can find. So we've just been standing by this ivy bush here and there's so many ivy bees and we've seen a few hornets which are actually really big and we've seen some peacock butterflies but it's just buzzing with life. 
just been standing by this little pond here watching some migrant hawker dragonflies. Some have been mating and I managed to get a photo of one in flight but they are quite tricky to photograph in flight as they're so agile and fast. There's also been a common data going around too. So we've had a brilliant day today here at RSBB Pauper Books for my 18th birthday walk raising money for the brilliant Cameron Bespoke Trust. We've seen clouded yellow butterflies, spotted flycatcher, lots of sandpipers, black-tailed gobwit, the list goes on. So it's been absolutely brilliant. I'd just like to thank you so much for your generous donations. It's all going towards engaging young people with nature, which is so important. Top work, Maya. Top work, glad you had a great day out, sun was shining, makes it a bit more pleasant. Plenty of birds being seen, obviously, and insects as well, the hawkers and the butterflies. Excellent stuff. Cameron Bespolkers Trust is uh, an organisation that organ you know, basically facilitates opportunities for young people to learn about nature. They work very closely and very often with the BTO, so they take young boys, it's getting a bit windy down here, and it's an icy wind as well. Um, the uh, particularly when you've got the hole in the trousers, of course, a gust going down my shin there, chilling it to the bone. Um, and uh, yes, and doing work to get young people ringing um, and, and uh, proactively, obviously, therefore, conserving birds as well. And you can still give, actually, to that walk, which is, uh, which is uh, Maya's uh, idea, which was great stuff. I'm just struggling here with a bit of paper in the wind. And so it's UKVirginMoneyGiving.com. Virgin uh, slash Maya Bambrick. So all you really need to know is to go to that money giving site orchestrated by Virgin and then slash Maya, M-Y-A, M-Y-A uh, Bambrick. And then you can uh, give her a little bit more, uh, which would be fantastic. Top work Maya and all those others that were involved. Good to see young people doing something proactive, top work, absolutely top work. It's soapbox time now. Um, litter. I work uh, on occasion and very pleased to work with uh, Keep Wet and Tidy. And Keep Wet and Tidy do a great work of drawing people's attention to not just the blight of litter from an aesthetic point of view, but also from the damage it does wildlife. A survey they did a couple of years ago showed that uh, hundreds of thousands of small mammals were meeting a grisly end in those plastic bottles that we throw out onto uh, roadsides and motorway embankments. Um, so this can have a direct impact on our wildlife. Uh, obviously, in that case, it's small mammals going inside the bottles and being uh, unable to get out. But entanglement is something which we frequently see. Here are some photographs that I took, actually, for a campaign run by Cape, Cape Britain, Keep Britain Tidy uh, a few years ago. Um, the shot of the hedgehog, I have to tell you, was um, <clears throat> set up and it was a hedgehog that was being rehabilitated. And we gently, gently attached the plastic and then gently removed it. No harm came to any hedgehog. Um, it did a little acting job for us. Um, but um, litter in the environment can be a serious problem, particularly when it comes to birds. So there's a campaign running at the moment, Birds and Debris, websites birdsanddebris.com. We want a greater understanding of the threat that all of this rubbish faces. You will have seen, of course, on TV, we've done it on Spring Watch. Yolo made a film a few years ago where we went out to a gannet colony, where at the end of every season, people go to not only um, you know, rescue the birds that they can that become entangled in the plastic that they're using to make their nest, but also have the grisly task of cutting down all of the dead ones that have become entangled and have had a miserable end hanging from that plastic until they're dehydrated and exhausted. Uh, not just seabirds, but many other birds get entangled too. So I'm just going to read you a little bit from the uh, Birds and Debris <coughs> website here. Anthropogenic debris, human debris, is a global environmental issue which can impact a wide range of species, essentially uh, birds. Marine debris, mostly plastic, has affected at least 36% of all seabird species through entanglement. It's not just seabirds, terrestrial and freshwater birds can also become entangled and incorporate de debris into their nests. I once saw a carrion crow's nest almost entirely made of plastic and wire. What were the chances of those young, you know, once they're hopping around, flapping their wings, they're bound to become entangled in that wire. And I'm sure that wasn't successful. And given the amount of debris, it says here, that can occur around towns and cities and in farmland areas, nest incorporation by terrestrial birds may be greater than we think. 
We don't fully understand which birds are affected, where entanglement and nesting creation of debris is taking place. So you can help us investigate this by uploading information of any bird species anywhere in the world, um, uh, plastic, metal, glass or fabric. And all you need to do is visit that website. And there's a map on the website, it's a map of the world. Um, lots of 198, I looked this morning, so so far 198 reports have been sent in for Europe and also in various other parts of the world too. So if you are watching overseas, we know that we have viewers in Australia and the United States, other parts of Europe. Kate, where was that person watching Giuseppe us? Giuseppe in Italy. Giuseppe is watching us in Italy this morning. Good morning, Giuseppe. Um, you can all join in and uh, send this in. It's uh, uh, an, or uh, an orchestration between a, a number of bodies. Let's have a look, North Highland College, University of the Highlands and Islands, and also the Natural History Museum as well. Um, so please visit that website, birdsanddebris.com. Um, and if you see any birds, take a photograph, upload it and send them the details so we can better understand this problem. As in all conservation issues, if we don't understand the problems, we can't address them. And of course, I suppose in the meantime, um, aside from taking part in this data collection, which is uh, really important, if you do find any debris in, in, the, in the countryside or even in urban areas where you are, then please litter, pick, pick it up, take it home, put it in a bag. You can curse a little bit about the person that's dropped it if you, if you really feel like you want to. Um, but don't just leave it there and, and moan about the fact that everyone's dropping their litter. Um, if, you know, pick it up and put it in a bag, something I have to do along the roadside outside my house with uh, some regularity. There's another lady who does it as well. I see her from time to time walking along the roadside and picking it up, doing our bit. So yeah, that, that's uh, something to think about. That was a bit of a tame soapbox. I didn't get too ranty there, did I actually? I didn't get too ranty. I suppose that's okay. Oh, just one other thing though, whilst we're on soapbox, and it is campaigning Friday, and that is Wild Justice, uh, the uh, not-for-profit put together by Mark Avery, Ruth Tingay and myself, uh, have a petition running at the moment. It was launched this week after a 52-day wait. Yes, we asked the government to launch our petition on the... Uh, ban the shooting of badgers immediately. Uh, the, the, the thing is that the shooting of badgers for the cull, which has started again, and we have spoken about this on a previous soapbox, is poorly monitored. And we believe that the animals um, that are being killed are, are not getting the welfare standards recommended by a 2014 independent expert panel whose recommendations were accepted by DEFRA. The method of culling, shooting, is inhumane and should be banned immediately. Sometimes these animals are being shot at night and even if top quality marksmen are being used, shooting badgers at night is never going to be easy. And we know for a fact that some of these animals are being shot and are taking longer than five minutes to die in abject pain and misery. There are many others, I'm sure, that are shot and whose bodies are never recovered because they scuttle off to die again in abject pain and misery in the bushes and trees of where they're being culled. This is not acceptable. The badger is a protected species, whether it is or isn't, it shouldn't be being killed in an inhumane manner. And there is no ambiguity about this. Again, government's own data tell us that numbers of these animals are dying in an inhumane way. It's a government e-petition and you can find it online. We'll post the details for it. I'm, I, I'm very pleased to say it was only launched yesterday and we already have 15,828 signatures. So at 10,000 we'll get a government reply. We passed that milestone almost immediately yesterday. Now we need to get this to £100,000 so that we stand the chance of having previously a debate in Parliament. Covid restrictions at the moment are preventing that. But nevertheless, um, action will be taken um, and so we can I ask you to take just a couple of minutes to sign that government e-petition to ban the shooting of lime, live badgers in the cull uh, because it is undoubtedly inhumane e-petition wild justice there we are finished off with a little bit of a rant which is jolly good let's move away from ranting now into something extremely beautiful and largely positive matt moran is a photographer and filmmaker who lives in suburban london <coughs> he's made us some very beautiful films telling us about the uh, life 
and times of a family of foxes that he follows and uh, films and photographs. And here is his update. He said it's going to be the last one of 2020, but 2020 is far from ending and the story's not over yet. So here's an update from, from Matt, which is absolutely lovely. So an update on the Cubs from the allotment is that I simply have no idea what is going on. And this is new to me this year. The past few years have been a little bit more predictable. But two vixens had litters, and after the vixen that I'd been filming moved her cubs from their den site, they've been spread out all over the place, which makes filming and photographing them much more of a challenge. And getting a handle on which cub belongs to which vixen is a tricky task. But for me, that's what makes the fox so fascinating to observe and photograph. And I find the more I learn about foxes, the less I know about foxes. The cubs are almost fully grown and must learn to fend for themselves. Then there's the added problem that they must move on and find a new territory. It's been pretty comfortable at mum's house up until now and the days of free food and rent and grooming on tap are almost over. Cubs venturing out for the first time on their own are at risk of running into all sorts of dangers. And earlier this spring, I had a dramatic encounter with a little cub. So we talked about it being a tough life for foxes oh. out here and we found one sort of half drowning in a little pond. It's still alive and breathing, but very weak. We caught a foxy. Well, we have, yeah, we've caught a little foxy. We decided to take the cub home and get some professional help. I knew we didn't have long. The cub was still very cold. We managed to warm it up in my garden studio and it did perk up, but it was having regular seizures. Unfortunately, I had to take this cub to my local vet and it was put down. Another obvious danger are cars, and sadly many are killed on our roads in this way. Sarcoptic mange is still a big problem. It's a microscopic mite that burrows into the skin of a fox, multiplies quickly, and without treatment, fox is usually dead in six months. Fortunately, there are some great people and really good organizations out there that help foxes that get in trouble. Here in the southeast, there's a South Essex Wildlife Hospital. The Fox Project in Kent takes in orphan and injured foxes, and they are rehabilitated throughout the summer with the aim of releasing them back into the wild. And in London, we have the Mama Cat Animal Rescue, an organization run by the tireless Karen Heath and a group of willing volunteers. They rescue sick and injured foxes and help to educate and inform the wider public. Foxagon are also a brilliant organisation. They provide humane deterrent service for individuals and organisations who want to deal with problem foxes, but without harming them. Certainly one of the main aims with all my work is to educate people. I want to bring them along on the journey with me. What will it take for people to learn to love what's on their doorstep? Every animal has a role to play, and the recent Mammal Society report should be a wake-up call a quarter of England's mammals are at risk of extinction. Now more than ever, we need to change our behaviour and attitudes towards the natural world. We're part of it. It's not something out there, even in a busy city like London. We need to look after it and get others inspired to do the same before it's too late. So what about the vixen? Well, every time I see her, I'm expecting it to be the last. But the good news is she's doing really well and is still the boss. Three of her five cubs have survived and they're looking really healthy. And for now, well, she's having a well-earned rest. Icy, absolutely icy. But that warmed the cockles of your heart, didn't it? I know the little cub didn't make it, but as Matt said, these foxes face all sorts of problems, but there's lots of positive things happening there as well. You know, three out of the five cubs still going, people working to manage foxes without killing them. 
And, you know, without getting back on the soapbox here, we for a long time had chickens at the farm here and uh, we only ever lost two to foxes, both to cubs at the end of the summer. Once when the electric fence was strimmed through by a gardener and another time when battery went flat. So with just a little bit of effort, you can actually look after, you know, any animals that you might have and keep foxes away without ever needing to result to harm them. That electric fence that Matt showed us there was fantastic. But what about the pictures? Again, stunning. That final shot, yawning, when you just see the little tooth coming down. Matt is a master when it comes to foxes, absolute master. He's been working on a book, actually, about those urban foxes, which will hopefully be coming soon. Um, please catch up with Matt Moran, Matt with a double T, Moran, M-A-R-A-N, photo on all social media. Matt Moran, photo, check out his photographs. They are absolutely brilliant, all showing the animals in that urban context. Um, all three of the Fox films that he's made for SIBC, you, you can watch at matthewmoran.com, Matthew moran.com and also he has an upcoming up and coming photo exhibition so keep an eye out on all of his channels for details of that um i guess it may well be virtual uh, depending on the uh, degree of lockdown that we're in at that point in time but uh, do everything you can to take a look at that stuff it's really really beautiful it's a fantastic filmmaker and photographer and a man who loves his foxes a man after my own heart lots of us obviously love our foxes too okay we're moving towards 10 o'clock. We're almost determined to finish on time to show Megan that it can be done, despite wittering. What about the quiz? Let's have another listen. That is beautiful. That is absolutely stunning stuff. Stunning stuff, isn't it? Well, it's the call of a woodlark. Not the call, the song of a woodlark. God, I'm beginning to lose it. It's the, it's the song of a woodlark. So woodlark are obviously a relative of the skylark, famed for trilling high in the sky. But woodlark will rise from a song post, flutter up into the air, begin singing, and then flutter down, delivering this song. So they don't do it with the aerial panache of a skylark, but they match them, I think, in terms of their acoustic capabilities. Um, so Kate, Kate is actually with me here this morning. What about that? Kate, come round, let's social distance, and you can tell us who got that right on the on the quiz. Um, okay, so on Facebook we have Rachel, Lorena, Jan, Tina, Philippa, Amber, Stephen, Nick, Martin, Paul, Michelle, Morgan, Anissa, Mel. And on YouTube we have Michael, Peregrine F1, Linda's Bay, Paula, and Simon, you got there in the end. Excellent stuff, thanks Kate. Top work. Not an easy one, the woodlark. If you haven't heard them um, and haven't enjoyed them, then um, that's pretty good going, to be quite honest with you. Um, we're coming towards the end. I've got some birthdays there. Yeah. Let's have a look whose birthday it is today. Sorry, it's all blowing around down here yeah. in the new forest. OK, Jennifer wants to wish her sister Barbara Roberts a happy birthday. She will be 54 on the 28th of September. Happy birthday, Barbara. Last week, Tracy Blackmore was 50. She went to Shatwick Heath and saw a marsh harrier. Now, that's my type of 50th birthday, going to Shatwick Heath and seeing a marsh harrier. Top work. Um, Jill says happy birthday to old dad, Trevor. It's a bit rude, Jill. Unless he's old, of course. He might well be very old, in which case it's justified. He's gone from watching pigeons and through the SIBC becoming obsessed with one nesting pair. Nothing wrong with that. Pigeons are very interesting. But actually, at the corner of my eye a moment ago, I saw a collared dove. And we never, this is the first year we've had collared doves here at the farm. One came, then two. I saw three yesterday. I saw three. Fantastic stuff. Helena, happy birthday tomorrow. Um, Hold on, it says 195 since, days. what's that? Sorry, 195 days since COVID in Spain, she said. 195 days since COVID in Spain, day 195. Mm. Happy birthday, Helena. Okay, I hope you have a good day tomorrow. Is that the birthday's done? And we've got one more, oh. which is Alison says, happy 82nd birthday to wow. Phyllis, my animal-loving friend in Lincolnshire. I hope you got that. Happy um, 
uh, happy birthday, 82nd birthday to Phyllis, animal loving friend in Leicester, Lincolnshire. Lincolnshire, in Lincolnshire. Happy birthday, Phyllis. That's the uh, top work. Now, look, we've saved possibly the best till last. Well, I don't know. We've had some good things on this morning. But Jack is now going to tell us about his third favourite dinosaur. Two things before we see it. Firstly, check out his T-shirt and what it says. It's true. And secondly, check out his dinosaur book, which has made me very envious because I don't have a copy of it. Here's Jack telling us all about Ankylosaurus. Ankylosaurus is my third favourite dinosaur. Reasons why? Because he was a good fighter, he wasn't a meat eater, he was a plant eater. He wasn't scary and he had a club. He was armoured on his back, his eyelids, his mouth, his neck and he was scary in his fights because he would he would have been fighting like t-rex carnotosaurus or, or suchomimus so what the ankylosaurus had armor uh, on its back you can see those pricks there and it had a club on its tail for defense and it even had armor over its eyelids isn't isn't that a bit funny it even had armor on its cheeks really on its tail jack absolutely fantastic the armored dinosaur ankylosaurus and yes it does have armor a Above its eyes, on its cheeks, it's got that club tail. I used to love Ankylosaurus when I was Jack's age. I still love Ankylosaurus now. I mean, obviously, but I was obsessed with Ankylosaurus, just like Jack. You know, at the thought of this massive armoured lizard, you know, going around looking like a tank, battering the legs of other predatory dinosaurs, trying to break into it, absolutely sensational. And I'm pleased to say that next week, Jack will be back with his second favourite dinosaur. You can try and guess what it might be. And then his first favourite dinosaur the week after. No prizes for guessing what that's going to be. Jack and I share an opinion on the best dinosaur ever. Now, it is 9.59, which means that we are going to finish dead on 10 o'clock. So Megs can stick that in her pipe and smoke it. Not that she's smoking pipes as far as I'm aware at this point in time, but nevertheless, there we are. Um, if you do have a birthday, you can send it in to us. Birthdays at sibird.club. Birthdays at sibird.club. Obviously, if you've got any ideas, we're keen to hear those as well. We're going to leave you with the peregrine. Oh, it's all blown away. We're going to leave you with the peregrine falcons in Melbourne in Australia and remind you, if you will, to sign the Wild Justice e-petition to ban the uh, shooting of badgers during the cull. I can tell you that since I asked you earlier um, to do that, we've now reached 16,030 signatures. Um, this is in less than 24 hours. Many of us have grave concern for the health and well-being of our badgers, and we can certainly help out by sending a clear message to government that we firstly don't want them shot, and secondly, we want the cull to end. It's 10 o'clock, absolutely spot on the button. It's been a great show this morning, I think you'll agree, with not too much wittering. Well, just a little bit of wittering about Bolton Port Defiance and going berserk, having taken a little bit of hallucinogenic mushroom. But aside from that, I hope you're uh, happy. Megs will be back here next week. In fact, she's going to be doing it on her own. Let's see if Megs can finish at 10 o'clock next week. Until then... Goodbye. Have a good week. Enjoy the peregrines.